Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Why don't we stand and begin in prayer? Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please welcome Dr. James Patrick. Well, I'm very pleased to be with you. In order to get the most from Dante's Divine Comedy, one should be competent in Latin, especially the Tuscan dialect in which he wrote, in Italian as well as the Tuscan dialect, and also in Latin, should have comprehensive knowledge of the politics of Europe in the 13th century, of the literature of the classical world, especially Virgil, should know all of Greek and Roman mythology from Hesiod on, should be aware of all the teachings of the Church Fathers and particularly be uh, cognizant of St. Thomas Aquinas, whom he relies on a great deal. But the good news is the rest of us can also learn a good deal from this greatest of poems, one which uh, John Ruskin called uh, the greatest poem by the central man of all the world. There have been many translations into English, one of the earliest in uh, the United States being by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Perhaps the two most often read are the ones I may have mentioned to you, the one by Mark Musa and the Dorothy Sayers translation. The task of translating Dante is, is daunting because the poem is written in a dialect particular to 13th century Tuscany composed, as one critic wrote in the author's native Florentine, elevated in many parts by exalted thought and an abundance of Latinisms. It sinks at times into the plain vernacular. This is, of course, the, the era in which the vernacular is being established as the language, and, the, uh, and Dante's poem was one of the things, is, of course, the great monument of Italian that, that made it a, a real language. The poem is also daunting because it is written in terza rima, in tercets, three-line poems written in iambic meter designed to rhyme in a pattern A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C. That is, so that the first and third line of each terset rhymes, with the middle line rhyming with the first and third lines of the following terset. Now, when you think about what an interesting job it is to translate that into English, and a couple of people have done it, very nicely, but there are, there are uh, so many rhymes in the English language, not nearly as many as there are in Latinate languages, I'm told. So to see it done at all is, uh, is remarkable. Said to be very difficult. Dorothy Sayers made the attempt, <clears throat> and she did so in a way that preserves the pleasure of the rhyme scheme. The first lines of the entire poem translated as follows. The glory of him who moves all things so air and penetrates the universe, and bright the splendor burns more here and lesser there. Then the second terse it is, within that heaven which most receives his light, was I and saw such things as man nor knows nor skills to tell, returning from vast height. So, so air and there and bright and light and height all have to rhyme, and to maintain this, through about some hundred cantos is, to say the least, difficult. I'm told that Italian speakers find American attempts to translate it in a rhyme scheme a little bit reasonable, but it 
repays, I think, because it gives you a sense of the motion of the poem. The Musa translation abjures the attempt to translate into the rhyming structure. It's said to be a nearly perfect translation. There are also, there's a wonderful translation by John Aiken, Carlisle, Thomas Oakey, and Philip Wixton. And if, even if the translator does not undertake the task of translating the Italian rhymes, the language itself, make, itself makes the English sing. Now, it would be fair for me to tell you at the beginning what to expect. I am not a literary critic, although it is a kindly language that anyone can get a few words of. I'm a theologian, more especially an historical theologian, with a second string in philosophy possessed of a love of literature. Historical theology is the story. Uh, systematic theology is the proposition. And I've always loved to be able to tell the story, which is a, particularly a way that young people tend to find it fairly easy to learn. But that's what I've spent my life doing. These lectures are, for me, a revisiting of Dante after many years, which has been a pleasure unanticipated and an honor, and for which opportunity I thank you. Few things are more important than keeping alive in imagination in the midst of life, and perhaps so especially for those not unfamiliar with the dark wood of the opening lines, the splendor of our own inheritance. Culture is not an ocean in which imagination may safely swim, or a world of monuments to which one may safely refer episodically, but a river that must be fed at its sources, else it will inevitably go dry. And the laws, customs, manners, and ideas we think of as culture will then disappear. That is to say, imagination must be vivified by being incorporated into the tradition so that we the living may enjoy and transmit the truths that are contained. This is uh, an attempt undertaken by institutions such as the Institute for Catholic Culture, a task especially important in an environment in which even the best of academic institutions is rarely able to discern and represent the central tradition of the West, a tradition which cannot be understood apart from the death and resurrection of the Son of God. It was a tradition in which Dante Alighieri moved and lived. That's an important point. The, um, I, I often find that people think of culture as a something. You go to France so that you see the cathedrals. And it's a something. It's a set of objects. And they're beautiful objects. Unfortunately, the faith that made those objects uh, is still, to some degree, alive, but not very much. And it's always important not to mistake the monuments for the culture and to realize that culture is a stream and that you are it. And that if you don't keep it alive, nobody is going to keep it alive. So I will begin this talk about Dante as every freshman essay must begin. He was born in 1265. When St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas were writing their greatest works, Italy was entering a period of magnificence with the building of cathedrals and public spaces. There was a new style. How, how many of you all have been to Italy? Tell me if you've been to Italy. You've been to Orvieto, you've been to Pisa, you've seen that wonderful quirky style of Italian Gothic. It's not really Gothic because structurally it's just the old Romanesque with the wonderful kinds of details put on it, but it's gorgeous. And that was what was happening in the late 13th century. Orvieto, Siena, the public space is there. But Dante would have considered himself, first of all, not an Italian, but a Florentine. The political unit that mattered was the city, compact within its walls, set at a countryside whose territory did not exceed a large American county. Now, later on, it got bigger, and it was at one point a grand duchy, and was maybe 100 miles across, but basically it was always a city. All of those Italian cities are. And he talks in the poem about about the fact that next door is Lucca, there's only one hill between Florence and Lucca, and then there's Pisa right down the road, and all of these are something that we don't, I think, have much experience of because there's a kind of local patriotism about it. 
In 1300, Florence had a population of about 50,000, about the size of London, and it was one of the most important cities in Europe. During most of Dante's lifetime, it was overshadowed by Rome as the city built toward the great jubilee year of 1300, but by the time of Dante's death, Rome had slipped back into the long disabito that would accompany the move of the Holy See to Avignon. And during this time, Rome was a patchwork of feudatories locked in their towers while sheep grazed in the Forum, a condition the Renaissance found when uh, the papacy returned. In this period, if you wanted to live well, you needed to take care of yourself, and that meant defending yourself. And Florence was very much like that. San Gimignano is the sort of hyperbole of that. In Florence, the frustrating project of building the new cathedral was begun when Dante was just about 30. And the cathedral can serve as a kind of symbol of a city seeking itself. The purpose of the cathedral was to state unequivocally in stone and marble the greatness of Florence. The builders had no very clear idea just how to erect a dome on a high drum unsupported by surrounding structure that would oppose the tendency of the dome to collapse outward. The project took more than a century, during which architect after architect struggled to find a way successfully to erect a dome on the great drum, which had been conceived with the idea that it would have singular size and gracefulness, but without any notion at all, or even a good theory, as to how to make it stable. Completing this civic monument would await the genius of Brunelleschi, and what had been begun in the Middle Ages would become the symbol of Renaissance Florence. But meanwhile, it stood for the genius of Florence, a grand project begun in ambition and hope, frustrated by human improvidence and pride. And you'll notice if you've had a chance to read the poem much that Dante has this enormous ambivalence toward Florence. He loves it deeply. He also thinks, perhaps because he knows the Florentines very well, that they may be among the worst people in the history of the world, the most quarrelsome, the most politically unstable, the most given to the, uh, the uh, hyperbole of, of family. You know, the, the uh, mafia is simply the last gasp of the fact that one of the great principles was you did everything for, for, your, for your family. The vision of Beatrice occurred when Dante was nine in 1274, and then she spoke again when he was 18. In 1277, he was betrothed to Gemma di Manetto Donati, whom he married, a union to which four children would be born. We know a good deal about him through his books, The Vita Nuova in 1292, right after Beatrice's death which marked the beginning of his philosophical studies, the convivio, or banquet, and the de vulgaria eloquentia, which is about the beauty of the uh, ordinary Latin language. Then his book about politics, the de monarchia, about 1313, and the divine comedy, most people think after 1315, although there's controversy about that. His exile from Florence was one of the central events in his life. He wrote, since it pleased the citizens of the fairest and most famous daughter of Rome. And that's important, because Dante is, a, uh, is romantically convinced of the importance of Rome, the Roman Empire, the great Christian Empire. Uh, he makes the people like Caesar founders of the Christian Empire, and Florence is wonderful because it's the daughter of Rome. I'd, since that time, I have wandered a pilgrim, almost a beggar, displaying against my will the wounds of fortune. He lived in hope that the Florentines would repent his exile. Their regret was not evident until after his death, when, in the way of such things, Florence uh, invited Boccaccio to celebrate his life, and when a long struggle in the event unavailing to have uh, Dante's body uh, return from Ravenna was begun but he's still in Ravenna. Through his books, Dante is the foundation of high medieval civilization that effloresced into the Renaissance. 
He knew the excitement of discovery, especially the sources on which the intellectual house rested. Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics and metaphysics were newly rediscovered. The Islamic commentators had opened a new intellectual front with their commentaries. Dante lived in the penumbra of two great scholar saints whose grace would adorn the church, Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventura. He knew Giotto, the painter, who, and Giotto did a portrait of him that's now faded in a public building in Florence. Giotto was responsible for the, for the frescoes in the uh, upper church at Assisi, which I bet many of you have seen. Uh, it was also the era of uh, Lorenzetti, who did the lower church there, who was a, uh, also a Florentine or familiar in Florence. Dante would also have known Arnolfo de Cambio, one of the successors of the masters of the fabric at the cathedral, who worked there in 1295 and 6, but more famous for his work in Rome, where he designed the baldacchinos at St. John Lateran, Santa Maria, and Trastevere, and probably the bronze statue of St. Peter, uh, who's, uh, who, which we all reverence. An Athenian would have understood Florence quickly and intuitively, but there are imaginal bars that we will find it difficult to cross. Among these barriers is an understanding of an almost religious love of place, deeper than what we would call patriotism that marked Dante and his contemporaries. On the walls of a public building was inscribed, Florence is full of all imaginable wealth. She defeats her enemies in war and civil strife. She enjoys the blessing of fortune and has a powerful population. Successful, she fortifies and conquers castles. She reigns over the sea, the land, and the whole world. Under her leadership, the whole of Tuscany enjoys happiness. Like Rome, she is always triumphant. I always remember that one of the Medici, I think it was Lorenzo, it's been a long time since I read it, began his will by thanking God that he had been a citizen of the city of Florence something that we probably wouldn't think of doing. This display of patriotism is generally inaccessible to us because the national state, particularly the titanic national strait that may stretch from the Florida Keys to Puget Sound, can be apprehended only through abstractions. If we are fortunate enough to have anything of patriotism in Dante's sense, it will probably have something to do with childhood memories reinforced by family tradition. But for Dante, Florence was a beloved city, at once the archetype of all good polities, of idealism and religion, and a loyalty that shaped his life. In that sense, it was a reiteration of the Greek polis, which defined civilized life, and outside of which there were only barbarians. See, this is why... The Greeks had this wonderful custom of ostracism that every nine, I think it was every nine years, if you had been unpleasant to your neighbors, they voted, and you had to leave. So you had to be good so you wouldn't be ostracized. That's where our word comes from. And, of course, the, uh, the Florentines just exiled you. You didn't have to even have to be unpleasant. You just had to be on the wrong side of politics. But the, 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 the conviction was that, that civilized life is in the city. And if you're not a part of the city, then you're probably a barbarian out there somewhere. Place was also related to Dante's life in Christ because he always spoke lovingly of the, bapti of the baptistry of the cathedral being the scene of his incorporation into the body of Christ. Now, from this display of patriotism, there also grew or was related or was underpinned by an organic Christian culture nestled in the heart of the church. The truth of the Catholic faith was, faith was not asserted or argued because it was assumed that all men of goodwill professed it. This does not mean that the effects of grace were realized more completely, a condition which, if it existed, we should have trouble identifying and the results of which we cannot know but there were intellectual themes, often fraught with moral consequences, common to Florentine life that are absent from our experience. 
that men and women had, or rather were, immortal souls, so that life was, and is, so to speak, all future, was simply assumed. It struck me this afternoon, thinking about this, and I'll probably say that again this evening, that one of the terrible things about hell is its fixity. Because I'd always kind of wondered why it was that Lucifer down there is just stuck. And if you think about it long enough, you'll have an idea. And I finally came to me that the reason Lucifer is just stuck is because everything in hell stuck. And in purgatory, you know, he may be out there like a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy. But as far as he is in hell, he's just there. And everything is just there. But one of the wonderful things about Christian life is it is all future because we know that we will live forever having been created by God in the beginning and that makes a difference. So the world was a texture of determinate beginnings. Life was not conceived as a career but as the fruition of, of life in the presence of God. The Aristotelian notion of actuality and potency fits nicely with the ideas that life and our experience of the world were all future. Uh, uh, Dante was a, an Aristotelian. He was a Thomist. Aristotle, one of the wonderful chapters in the history of Christian thought is, should be titled, Why Plato Didn't Ruin It All. Because the incarnation and the resurrection are, of course, the central... Uh, facts of Christian life. And Platonism viewed in, in, it, in, in its entirety is entirely skeptical of the present world and has no way of talking about this. But then Aristotle came along for whom what mattered was this particular thing. And knowing the world always came from engaging this particular thing with the understanding that the world was not an illusion that we were not simply looking for some abstract set of ideas in the sky. And Dante was an Aristotelian. And this notion of becoming, that everything is always becoming, is, is right at the heart of everything he writes. Life of Florence on the Arno proceeded against the background of the larger world he describes for what the future held for each soul was either the inferno or paradise with a very substantial theological footnote to paradise called Purgatory Rhythm. Dante's poem is a survey of what is. Christians were destined to live forever, either in the presence of God or in hell. Life was in every way a moral adventure in which the project was to cultivate knowledge and virtue, to extirpate the seven deadly sins, and as such it was a rather dangerous and exciting moral adventure in which the fruition of life would be either glory or shame and punishment. One may suppose that, as in the case in the culture, Florentines thought these propositions to be true, but did not believe them. If you look around you in the Catholic Church at present, I think you'd find lots and lots of people who believe, Newman might call that notional assent, who believe that it, it's probably it's all true. They just don't believe them. And when you look at any culture, you find that there's a texture of a general kind of consent that's going to be different from the people who really believe it. But that kind of notional assent is a good background. Newman was quite right to say that it is folly to maintain that more souls were saved in the 13th century than the 19th. He had a long, wonderful correspondence with a dear friend who was going to write a book that proved that Dante's century was the century in which we knew that more people went to heaven. And in that wonderful way that Newman had, he wrote back a calm little letter and said, well, now let's think about this for a while. And throughout a correspondence of about 18 months, the book sort of began to take a different shape because the fact of the matter is we have, even if you want to believe that, we have no way on earth to know that. And it's always easy to confuse the kinds of things that culture does, which may be beautiful and wonderful, with the fact that the people who did them are saints, which may or may not be true. Now, I do not point out the organic nature of Dante's Catholicism and of Florentine Catholicism in order to mourn its absence from the 21st century for, 
as Eliot said, one must live in grace in the age in which God has placed us. The theological order of Florence, which was the Catholic faith, implied a political order, and indeed something deeper than the political order, which was an ideal of a common European civilization that realized the aspirations of Rome, but assumed the universality of something that might loosely be called Christendom. I always, you know, find that if we had an exam out at the door and I ask you to tell me about the Holy Roman Empire, the only thing you would remember was that somebody said it wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire, all three of which happened to be untrue. Because given the... Uh, the the domain of human endeavor, it made a good shot at trying to be holy, or at least of supporting the Catholic faith. It was an empire, and it was the perpetuation of Rome. And it, well, I don't want to digress about that, but it was, there's a wonderful professor named Don Livingston who has an argument that it was, the, it was the best polity that's ever existed because it had the principle of subsidiarity down. There are, what, 238 principalities or bishoprics or little things around, each one of which had its own particular kind of way of life. Uh, everybody remembers the old, the, the wife of uh, George V was named Mary of Tech. If you're as grown up as I am, you can remember her poking around in the rubble in the war movie. She was always out there in her hall t tall hat with her pearl choker poking around in the rubble. And, and her title was Mary of Tech. Tech is, a, 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 Annandale is about the size of Tech. And that was one of the principalities of the Holy Roman Empire. They seemed to get along pretty well throughout all those years. So it was a kind of distinctive polity that recognized those kinds of, of subsidiarity. The political order Dante wrote about in his De Monarchia, which involved the principal political question of the late 13th century, the relation between the church and the empire. Dante was endlessly romantic about Rome, whose contemporary incarnation he considered the empire of the Swabian princes. The idea of a single empire suffused with a single religion, representing a discrete literature, was never absent from his thought. And it is remarkable that 200 years later, St. Thomas More was bemused by the claim that the authority of the papacy was of law, when in fact, he simply thought that the Pope was the center of Christendom, which was universally accepted and nowhere contested. And if you read his letters, this is interesting journey he goes through, figuring out that no, it really is a matter of essential teaching of the church. It's not just an historical reality. But if you look at Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries, there wasn't much reason to do anything but assume that it was just a kind of historical reality. The Pope was the center of Christendom and universally accepted. More came finally to believe that the Pope held his authority by divine law, but that was not where he began, which was in the penumbra of an organic culture in which those presuppositions were simply assumed. In such a culture, the claims of religion and the claims of political life, one claiming a transcendent moral government that inevitably involves political and ethical considerations, and the other claiming absolute political authority with its attendant set of legal and economic interests, these things are bound to exist in a kind of constructive confusion. It will not do to say that the church uh, rules the and the prince governs the body. Like so many of our Lord's saying the, sayings, the advice to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's does not exactly draw the line that we need to have to know what does belong to Caesar. Dante's Florence was threatened not only by the medieval hypertrophy of family, take care of your own in a political sense, but more significantly by the dissolution of the synthesis of papal and imperial principles that Europe had navigated its way through successfully for a thousand years. I've always been interested and pleased that even secular historians will acknowledge the fact that one of the wonderful things about what's called the investiture controversy was that it could not be settled. Consequently, it created a space in which people lived. 
it could not be settled because the claims of the church in a moral sense are, ab are absolute. The prince justly rules. The church in the 13th and 14th century was a perpetual irritation to the prince and in the 10th and 11th. Among other things, it kept getting richer and richer. And it didn't get richer and richer because uh, this was ill-gotten gain. It got richer and richer because people just kept giving it land. It also wanted to have a system of courts so that priests were tried in a different set of courts. It also wanted to send money from the kingdoms of France and England and the principalities of Germany to Rome, which the princes didn't like so much. But down to the time of Dante, a way of living with this had sort of been figured out. And what, what you're going to see in very, at the very time when he is writing is, this is coming unglued, and it's sort of the beginning of the modern world, and it, I suppose, is to be regretted if historical facts can, can ever be, be regretted. Even secular historians have noted that this system, or lack of system, was at the root of late medieval creativity, the period when so much that we would attribute to the Renaissance, from accounting to scientific uh, movements, was really invented. For the assertion and counter-assertions of papal and imperial interests <laughs> created a space in which civic life blossomed, the universities flourished, and Dante respectfully, sometimes fearfully, entered this battle, always on the side of the empire. At the heart of the matter was the final inability to settle something called the investiture controversy. Now I want to teach you all what that is. And the, because it's important to this whole world. And investiture is, is when you're invested with an office. Did you all, how many of you saw the wedding? The William and Miss Middleton wedding. Everybody saw the wedding. Did you see, did you see their graduation from St. Andrews? When they, when they knelt down, and I don't know what the object was the chancellor put on their heads, but he said something, and, and that was what investiture was like. The, the traditional gesture is this. You put your hands like this, and the person who's granting you something puts his hand around yours, and you make a promise. And I'm going to say this a little more fulsomely in a minute, but this was a civilization based on promises. And what happened at this time when you were invested with an office is you were given the symbols of the office. If you were a bishop and you were invested with the office of being the Bishop of Paris, Archbishop it would have been, you were given a pastoral staff and a ring. And the whole controversy centered around who got to give you the staff and the ring. Because if the Pope or the Pope's representative gave you the staff or ring, you were his man and you owed loyalty to him. But if the prince did that, then you owed loyalty to the prince. Now clearly, the princes did everything they could to maintain control of these great officials who inhabited their kingdom. And that meant that they were perpetually trying to get their own candidate in there and perpetually trying to see to it that, uh, that he understood that he was obligated to the prince, not to the pope. How many of you have been to Blenheim Palace? I bet a lot of you have been to Blenheim Palace. One of the things they always show you in Blenheim Palace is the banner that is the feudal dues of the Marlborough family to Her Majesty. Because every year, I'm sure it's lapsed by now, but every year in order to keep Blenheim Palace, the Marlboroughs had to send whoever was the crown one of those banners. Sometimes it was three acres. It could be any little thing, but it was always some exchange of tokens in that way. Now there were two theories about the relation between the Pope and the princes. One of these can be seen today blazoned on the walls of what was once the dining room of Pope Leo III, a papal palace that stretched across the hill right in front of where the Lateran now stands. If you've ever looked up to your left, you will see it because it used to be the dining room and it was inside. Now it's outside because the rest of the palace is gone. But what it depicts is a very large St. Peter 
with two small figures about as high as his knees kneeling by him. One of the figures is named Carolus. And to Carolus, St. Peter is giving the sword. The other figure is named Leo. And to Leo, St. Peter is giving the keys. But this is the illustration of the fact that all power in heaven and earth is given to the church. That's one theory. Another theory is the theory that God gives power to the emperor. He gives power to the pope. And you just better get along somehow. Another theory that came down the pike about the time Dante was departing this world is the theory that the church is just a department of state. Marsilio Padua wrote a book that did enormous damage arguing that, and it was taken up, of course, by all the princes on their behalf. The alternative theory that the, ki the, the, the king and the pope just have to get along is a particularly Eastern theory, although it had some currency in the West. This theory would be encouraged by a thing called conciliarism, which argued that a council of Christendom was superior to the Pope. It is interesting to me also always that Marsilio of Padua's book was taken back to England by Thomas Cromwell just in time for Henry VIII to peruse it as bedtime reading, which I'm sure he enjoyed. In fact, when the European church was in health, it was broadly realized that there was no perfect theoretical resolution. It was the work of the papacy to prevent the bishops becoming the king's man and the work of the king to see that the same bishop, a local magnate, often possessed of lands and wealth no less impressive than the royal holdings, was loyal to the prince. The papacy knew at its heart that if in this civilization of promises in which every man's duty was to his lord, it could not control Episcopal appointments. The church would become thoroughly secularized, as it did in part with the revolutions of Philip the Fair, which is contemporary with Dante. It persisted in Gallicanism, Frenchism, the notion that France is the eldest daughter of the church, and know your holiness, we don't teach heresy, but this don't give us any instructions because we're perfectly capable of doing what we want to do. It persisted in a thing called Josephinism. You all have all seen Amadeus. You remember old Too Many Notes. That was Joseph II. He was the person who ran the religious orders out of the, the Holy Roman Empire unless they would teach school or run hospitals because he considered prayer ineffective and troublesome. All of that is the result of this kind of view of things. In Dante's day, the battle at the height of its intensity, the prince, unless devout, always found it intolerable that the church should perpetually acquire property, always as the fruit of piety, but in great quantities. In the 14th century in England, the Bishop of Winchester was a greater landowner than the king. Now, of course, as long as the clergy was celibate, a practice much approved of by the barons, it was impossible to do more than enrich one's nephews, cousins, brothers, aunts, and uncles. But nevertheless, the fact of the existence of another kingdom within the kingdom and another system of courts was a constant irritation. The question came to a boil with Boniface VIII. And you will notice, if you've had a chance to read the book, that Dante cannot get Boniface VIII off of his mind. Out there at the very end of the story, if we were in paradise, he could not resist one final reflection on the fact that Boniface VIII is in hell upside down because he was so very, very bad. See? And he's very, very bad because he wrote a letter named Unum Sanctum, which set off a kind of chain reaction across European politics in which he said it is necessary for every human soul to be subject to the successor of Peter. Now, you know, there are ways that you could say that. And there is a sense in which that is deeply true along the moral horizon. But when you just hurl it in the face of Philip IV of France, what's going to happen is he's going to take your successor to Avignon, 
for several decades to enjoy the French climate. <laughs> so it wasn't fortunate every way. You, the other words you need to know that you probably do know are Gelf or Welf and Ghibelline or Weibligen. Perhaps you haven't thought of those all year. But they are the terms in which this contest that determined the future of Europe went on. A Guelph or Welf was a supporter of the papacy. A Ghibelline, Ghibelline was renamed after the imperial castle up in Bavaria, Weiblingen. They were the imperial party. The whole thing is enormously complicated by the fact that Dante was a uh, white Guelph, which meant that he was of the papal party, but he thought that the em emperor ought to not be bothered by the pope. It reminds me kind of the constitutional Whigs in the 1850s, who were determined, who were bound to uh, lose. It's co the complicated controversy. Dante was brought up in Guelph. These are words of, of Dorothy Sayers that were so beautiful that I couldn't resist them. Dante liked the sturdy, native quality of the Guelphs. Their tang of the soil as an old-fashioned squirearchy. Their rooted Republican constitutionalism and their modern liberal outlook. Their underlying, underlying Puritanism and conduct religion. But he did not like the commercialism and vulgarity of the self-made middle class that was growing up, up among them. And he came more and more to loathe and fear the temporal power of the papacy, which their policy supported and encouraged, the avarice and corruption of a wealthy church, the appalling prevalence of simony in every ecclesiastical office, and the undignified spectacle of the vicar of Christ maneuvering like a bishop on a chessboard in which kings and queens set the pace. But by many of his strongest sympathies, he was drawn to the Ghibellines. He liked their princeliness their largeness of mind, the magnificent aristocratic gesture, the patronage of art and learning, the heritage and reflection of the house of Swabia. He came to be of their mind in desiring a united Italy free of papal interference, but he could not but dislike their irreligion, their lack of principle, their corruption of the law, their tyranny, their Gothic clannishness. He could not know but that their regime of despotic privilege was a thing outmoded. But as Sayers goes on to point out, in a world defined by the tension between papacy and empire, to be not wholeheartedly in favor of either was to court political catastrophe. And so that's why Dante's going to go away in 13, to, is it, to be in exile, because he had, through a series of political events, fallen out of favor with everybody. Boniface VIII, whom a contemporary historian described as learned, but very proud and haughty, covetous, and more worldly than befitted his dignity, did many things that were displeasing to God. That's his contemporary. Among these was his letter, Unum Sanctum, which claimed that every soul should be subject to the Roman pontiff without any distinction made between moral and political obedience. This was a turning point in the history of the medieval church, and Dante sort of knew it was. In fact, on the theoretical point, Boniface could be defended. Unpleasant as he may have been, and very many of the popes of this period were unpleasant characters, he was broadly right, but the context was one in which the sweeping assertion, with its confusion between a legitimate moral authority and a doubtful political authority, was bound to be challenged by the king of France, the context was one in which the economic and political interests of the Pope and the French king were vehemently opposed. The bull, and if, it, if the bull and its response had been cast in terms of something other than power, if the Pope had not been anxious of gain, if he had written from a 64-acre state instead of a principality that ran from the Campania up to Ravenna, then the outcome may have been different. Dante wrote in the Purgatorio, when Rome reformed the world, she showed two sons to lighten the twin ways that went one with the other, the world's road and God's road. The church of Rome doth fall into mire, and striving to combine the two powers in one, fouled itself and load and all. 
The response of ordinary Catholics was to propose a separation of powers with the Pope presiding over spiritual matters and the king over matters political, but this would not alleviate the situation in which the prince is the moral subject of the Pope and in which the Pope took as their warrant the necessity for disciplining, disciplining Christian princes who were in the ultimate sense sinners just like everybody else. The separation theory never worked. The conciliar theory that a council is superior to a pope never worked. Popes kept deposing princes until 1588 when the pope attempted to depose Elizabeth I. But Dante is very much caught up in all of this. His conviction, based on a good deal of evidence, is that it's all about money. He faults Constantine. He, he loves Constantine for founding the empire, but he detests Constantine for having given to the Pope the Lateran Palace and beginning the process of enriching the church. He wishes that the church were poor. He lives in a situation in which the interests of the empire and the interests of the church are a principal cause of chaos with death and destruction in its wake. Our experience of the investiture controversy is no more intense than the snorting displeasure of national public radio when some bishop somewhere has gotten out of line and challenged a senator who refused to vote against abortion, or perhaps a priest who had been too outspoken about Hibana Vitae. We live in a different world, one in which there are no princes in the sense in which Dottie would have recognized, and in which politicians, their political heirs, consider even straightforward teaching often to be a threat to civil peace. And to add to that sense of distance that we have from them, we are separated from Dante's Florence by our imaginal estimate of the world, of the nature of the sun, the stars. Uh, you'll notice, you will know, one fact everybody knows is that every, all three parts of the Divine Comedy end with the word stars. The, the unforgettable line, you know, if you could just write one line, the love that moves the sun and other stars, which is the last line of the Paradiso, and which has in it all of that Aristotelian, Thomist truth, you know. But there's a different view of that. I will mention again, that we mention this again later. There were first of all the bare astronomical facts. Dante's world was the child of Ptolemy and Aristotle, especially the metaphysics 12. The seven planets are set in crystalline spheres with the earth nestled at the center. Beyond these is the realm of God and the blessed, the prima mobile, the first mover, moving the spheres not by efficient mechanical causality, but by the final causality of love. A world, the, the phrase from Aristotle is, a world drawn to God by love. Now, this is another thing you need to learn. Because we live in a world of efficient causality, which is billiard ball causality. Billiard ball A hits billiard ball B, which moves billiard ball C. If you think about your being here tonight, efficient causality would say that the reason you're here is because your car started. A more significant kind of causality is the one that's involved in the love that moves the sun and other stars, which is final causality, that for the sake of which something is moving and becoming itself, which is really very beautiful and much deeper. So you have this world with all these spheres moving, and they're moving through a complicated kind of mechanism because they're drawn to the first mover by love. Now, that's a different world from the bigger ball world. The notions of the planets and stars also had a deeper meaning. Since Ptolemy and Aristotle, the world had believed that human affairs were governed by the stars. Christianity moderated but did not displace this idea. The stars inhabited the realm beyond the moon. Everything beneath the moon was human. Everything beyond the moon was somehow divine. This was the realm of the permanent. The earth below the moon was transitory and defective. There is a long passage, fairly long passage, not so long passage, in the Paradiso 16. Dante is always running into people. If you've, if you've read the book, you'll notice that he's going through hell, he's going through purgatory, 
And he runs into, he says, well, hello, William. I remember you from back when we were doing X. One of the people he runs into is a character named Marco, about whom we don't know anything at all other than his name. But Dante has a question, which is, what about the necessity caused by the stars? And Marco is going to answer it. And it just happens that this is put in Marco's mouth. I was a Lombard. Marco was my name. I knew about the world. I love that good at which men now no longer aim their bows. The path you're on will lead you to the stairs. This is out of here. Then he replied and added, Now I pray that you will pray for me when you're above. It's one of the great monuments, the communion of the saints. I first was made aware of it below, and now it plagues my mind a second time. For your words, second what I first heard there, the world indeed, as you have just declared, is destitute of every virtue known, swarming with evils, ever breeding more. What is the cause of this? Please make it clear that I may teach the truth to other men and see it in the stars, some on the earth. A deep sigh wrung by grief into, alas, came first and then. The world, brother, is blind, and obviously the world is where you're from. You men on earth attribute everything to the sphere's influence alone, as if with some predestined plan they move all things. If this were true, then our free will would be annihilated. It would not be just to render bliss for good or pain for evil. The spheres initiate your tendencies. This is so smart. Way back there in the 14th century, the, the spheres initiate your tendencies. Not all of them. But even if they did, you have the light that shows you right from wrong and your free will, which, though it may grow faint, in its first struggles with the heavens can still surmount all obstacles if nurtured world. well. You are free subjects of a greater power, a nobler nature that creates your mind, and over this the spheres have no control. So if the world today has gone astray, the cause lies in yourselves and only there. Now that's bound to be where Shakespeare got the line. Who is it? Is it Horatio who says, the fault is not in the stars but in us? As you read this, you, know, you just keep hearing resonances of, of, of these kinds of things. If the world has gone astray, the cause is not in yourselves. I shall carefully explain the cause. From the fond hands of God who loves even her even before he gives her being, there issues forth just like a child, all smiles and tears at play, the simple soul, pure in its ignorance, which having sprung from her creator's joy, will turn to anything he, it likes at first. She is attracted to a trivial toy, and though beguiled, she will run after it, or guide, or curb, if guide or curb do not divert her love. Men, therefore, need the restraint of laws. Indeed, a, a ruler able to at least discern the towers of the true city. True, the laws there are, but who enforces them? No one. The shepherd who is leading you can chew the cud, but lacks the cloven hoof. Now, here we're descending into the criticism of the church and the fact that it's an unclean animal. And so the flock that see their shepherd's greed and for the same worldly goods that they have craved, are quite content to feed on what he feeds. As you can see, bad leadership has caused the present state of evil in the world, not nature that has grown corrupt in you. On Rome that brought the world to know the good, once shone two suns that lighted up two ways, the road of this world and the road of God. The one sun has put out the other's light. The sword is now one with the crook, and fused together, this must bring misrule. And that's his political program. A third, more fundamental habit of mind which separates Dante's world and ours is the presence in Dante's poetry of an unconscious but highly significant understanding of the past. I wonder if I can explain this, but I love to try. <clears throat> it was a presupposition of medieval imagination that everything usable is here. In imagination, now. This is the reason why they've just incorporated all of the classical past into 14th century Florence. And they do this shamelessly. I remember decades ago being bemused by the fact that in Siena, the prophets are down the center aisle, the sibyls are down the side aisle, and of course, the sibyls were not 
Christian prophets. But it has been the tendency of the church from the beginning just to co-opt the classical world. You'll notice, if you read the story, that, that Dante, the word Christ does not appear in the first two poems. It's always a reference to Jove. And he does that without any kind of self-conscious anything. And that's because that world has sort of been made Christian. They've sort of brought it all in here. There's a presupposition of medieval imagination that everything usable was present. This, among other things, made the Eucharist unproblematic in a way that it would not after 1500. Not only was Christ's action present now, but so were Virgil, Cato, and the Sibyls. The 13th, 13th century found nothing anachronistic about the figure of Socrates in a doctor's gown of the University of Paris on the door of Chartres, or about the image of the Blessed Virgin, I always love those, with sitting in front of the castle with the pennants flying up there, because she's in the 13th or 12th century. She's not back there at all. Leonardo's painting of the Last Supper features... Um, 17th century Italians with billowing sleeves, which of course is how it would have been as far as they were concerned. Part of this presence of the past is a tendency to incorporate the pagan story into the Christian story. This began, of course, with the incorporation of Plato and Socrates back in the second and third centuries, when Christian philosophers like Justin Martyr are just convinced that, some, that you just can't read, play, can't, particularly Socrates. Socrates died for the truth, and you just can't uh, fail to reverence him somehow, and as you're going to see, Dante does in, in a big way. This incorporative historiography made the great Romans Dante's contemporary. The fourth canto of the Inferno catalogs the virtuous pagans, men in a virtue in which the pains of hell have been mitigated. Now, this is a new, a new proposition with Dante, and I'm not sure it occurs anywhere else. But he just gathers up all of these. He gathers up the canon, the intellectual canon of his world and says these people cannot be down there in the depths of hell. They can be right on the edge, but because of their greatness, their difficulties have got somehow to be mitigated. The signature of honor they left on earth is recognized in heaven and win, wins them ease in hell out of God's favor. The great citadel of light, the citadel of reason, surrounded by seven battlements of the seven liberal arts. I glory in the glory I have seen, says Dante. The philosophers are the same catalog that Raphael will immortalize a hundred years later in the School of Athens. These are noble souls. In the center was Aristotle, the master of all who know, ringed by the great souls of philosophy. All wait upon him for their honor and his. The heroines are heroines of Roman history. All are present. A secondary point about imagination is that geography has not been reduced to number, but still moves out of significance. Maps of the 13th century located Jerusalem in the center of the world. The, the one great example of this is the cathedral in Hartford that has a wonderful map of Mundi, but there are many of them. With a huge Jerusalem, off there on the left there's a little bitty Rome, and occasionally there's a dot for Paris or London, but they're not important because what's important is Jerusalem. This way of making the past present in imagination, along with the tendency to prefer significance rather than geometry in describing the world or history, is alien to the modern mind, which is suffused with a kind of positivistic understanding of history, and which therefore thinks of the past as something that can be arranged along a line disappearing into the past. This is a habit, of course, fed by the delusion that since there is progress in our engagement with nature, and if not progress, at least change, there ought to be progress in things human. But alas, there has been no progress in human nature. And when you see a person now who loses his temper and shoots someone over a woman, he's just replaying the first part of uh, the Iliad. 
So the poem is a comedy, a story with a happy ending, ending in feasting and a marriage. The precedent is remotely the Bible, written in the vernacular of Florence. It presupposes a theory of language. What Dante assumes about language, his rough theory about what language can do, must be held firmly in mind in the age of Hume, as perfected by people like A.J. Ayer and G.E. Moore. These are philosophers that may not mean a thing to you, but they do mean something to you. Because these are people who shape the world you live in. And when you say, when you say, we can't know anything but matters of fact, you're just quoting G.E. Moore. The abolition of man, the first part, the business about the relation between value and words, just sentiments, that's Dante's theory. The Divine Comedy is, in the analysis of T.S. Eliot, played out in his Clark Lectures of 1826, both metaphysical and, and philosophical. There, Eliot compared Dunn and Dante, commenting that in each case there was a philosophy and a mysticism. For Dante, the philosophy of Aquinas and the mysticism of the Victorines, about which I may have a chance to say more later. Philosophical poetry is written when a philosophical system is felt as a whole by the poet as Dante feels Thomas Aquinas. When it affects the structure of the poem, when it is believed. In Dante, you have a system of thought and feeling. Every part of the system felt and thought in its place, and the whole system felt and thought. And you cannot say that it is primarily intellectual or primarily emotional, for thought and emotion are the reverse sides of the same thing. Perhaps of all the, inhabit, the habits of imagination that separate us from Dante is the figure of Beatrice. What can one say? Dante sees Beatrice twice and then in the Paradiso. She dominates imagination throughout his life. I'm going to take Eliot's side and say that Dante's experience of Beatrice, rather than being unique, is a common experience, and that nine years old is not too early for it to happen. The great difference between Dante's Beatrice and, and Dante's ability to move the vision is, is the ability of Dante to move the vision into a, a, a multi-layered idea in which Eros is caught up in charity. Virgil addresses her in these words, O lady of virtue, through whom alone mankind surpasses everything within the smallest circle of heaven, that Beatrice is once the Beatrice lived, who lived the Beatrice who is in imagination always in the presence of God, reflecting the love of God for him. In the age of courtly love, this was an idea that had currency. It lingered on into the 19th century, the woman on the, meta on the metaphorical pedestal, the paradigm of purity, and indeed into the 20th century, where she inhabited imagination in a corrupt ballad tradition. I keep thinking someday that I will collect all the songs that were around uh, in the 1950s which, that are about the woman and heaven, because it's a vast. Yeah. They're all rooted in this. The, the traditions run downhill. This is the tradition run, run downhill somewhere. Her enduring ability. Does anybody here remember... Shakespeare wrote a poem about Anne Hathaway, and it has the line in it, if I remember correctly, she saved my life. And people have always kind of wondered about that. But you know, it, it's, it's, it's Dante's point, too, that she saved his life. Theologically, understanding Dante depends on seeing woman in her true character as the reflected light of the second eve rather than as a co-conspirator against God's order. Finally, in the poem, of course, she is rather suffused with or taken up into the image of the Virgin. So that's what I have to say by way of introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, 
please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.